I kind of, and if, to be honest, I really like, I don't want to talk about this because I don't want to get people mad at me. And it just kept ringing in my ear, and I kept ringing in my ear, and I said, okay, I'm going to read it, and we'll see how God moves in our lives. And in Matthew, he's talking, he writes there in chapter 16 of verse 24, Jesus says to the disciples, and he tells them, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. And interestingly, the, um, the skit had that, you know, self-denial. I said, okay. But it says he must deny himself and pick up his cross and follow me. Is it possible for one to deny themselves when there's so much available that brings pleasure? Because that's the real crux of the matter. I mean, if we lived in a desert with no money and nada, it'd probably be very easy to deny ourselves because there's nothing else to do if Scripture asks that. But we, we live in Colorado Springs. Well, the land flowing with milk and honey, leche, azúcar, right? So I'm thinking about that, and I, I looked at the average annual expenditure of the average family. And we're pretty average here. You know, most people spend about 34% on housing, 17% on their transportation, 13% roughly on their food, personal care services, you know, health care, about seven, a little over 7% of their income, and clothes, you know. Three, three, a little three and a half percent, some of us, 10%, especially if you have a charge card at Macy's or something like that, right? So you look at about 75% of everything you spend already is spent on you. Without even thinking about it, we're just going with life. We're not really like thinking like this, it's just life, correct? Nothing fancy, nothing crazy. Of the remaining 25%, about 7% is spent on entertainment, Another 1% on, on alcohol, and another percent on tobacco. So of the remaining 25%, you would say about 8% is spent on stuff. Just stuff. Doesn't bring no value other than it's entertaining or whatever. Cops you a buzz. Then I, be, I, I again, think about it. Man, Lord, you know, life is pretty difficult. We're saying, you're saying deny ourselves so we can follow you. And I'm not saying that we have to limit those things, these very, the first things, but there's other things like that 8% of entertainment, alcohol, and tobacco, and smoking supplies, and whatever other kind of supply you might grab. Not that you would grab any other kind of supply. I'm just, in case you knew somebody who would do that. But there's other things that come in a person's way that cause them to look away from Jesus. And that's what we're talking about, following Christ, correct? Did you know that every second, every second, $3,000, well, $3,075.64 is being spent on pornography on the internet every second. 40 million Americans regularly, regularly visits porn sites. So there's some of, and not, we're not talking about the world, we're talking about the United States of America. That includes Christians and, and the world, right? That's a, that's a little bit. And I go, well, that's, you know, deny ourselves and follow you, okay. It's getting a little deeper now, God. You know, I'm just trying to figure this scripture out. The outdoor industry, which Colorado Springs is one of the major hubs of the outdoor industry, that association, the, uh, the, uh, actually it's called the Outdoor Industry Association's Recreation Economy Report. They've said roughly $23 billion was spent on hunting last year. 23 billion. Roughly 33 billion, billion was spent on wildlife viewing. Um, some people really get off on looking at wildlife. Amen? I, I imagine I'd rather have them looking at wildlife than wildlife. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and then you have 35 billion was spent on fishing last year. So remember, Jesus says, Deny yourself, 
and pick up your cross, follow me. Now I'm saying, well, God, you know, that's a lot of denial right there. Is he talking about that? I don't think he's talking that in total. However, everybody has to make a choice, correct? Because I don't know. I'm I'm different than you. We all have different uh, things we like to do and things we should do and things we shouldn't do. Correct? Amen? Amen. Are you with me? Then I said, oh, let me look at so I'm just, you know, I'm just kind of investigating, because if we're talking denying ourselves, then what are we really going to have to do? In 2013, Americans spent 80, $83 billion on beer. By 2018, they expect that to go to $95 billion. That's, a lot, that's like, a, like, wow, that's a lot of beer. Lottery tickets last year, Americans spent $70.15 billion on lottery tickets. That tops $63 billion spent on sports, tickets, books, video games, movies, and music. Are you getting the picture? Yeah. Now, SMUT, we talked about earlier, the porn industry breaks in $11 billion annually. Then I started, I think, okay, let's, let's look at some, you know, let's get practical here. Taco Bell! One time I had a friend, his name was Larry Vogley. I was the best man in his wedding. And he's like blonde haired, white, white as they can be. He goes, hey, Al, let's go, let's meet. And I go, where are we going to meet? He goes, we meet at a, a Mexican restaurant. Sure. And, a, and so he drives, he put a trick on me, right? He drive, I drive down the street and he, and he pulled me into the Taco Bell parking lot. I go, are you kidding me? I looked at him, Larry, this is not Mexican food. He goes, no, I'm just kidding. He drove right past and went to the Mexican restaurant, right? <laughs> I go, that was a good one, Larry. I mean, I knew you were white, but you're not that white. I mean, come on, man. Taco, Taco Bell. Americans spent more than $6 billion at Taco Bell. And my, my, my grandson works at Taco Bell. He said, Grandpa, don't eat there. <laughs> Hallelujah, right? You don't, uh, oh, little poppy said, anyway. Snacks. We should go to snacks. What can snacks do, right? The U.S. consumers are currently spending about $6 billion on potato chips. And I know that's true because, you know, so somehow potato chips keep coming at my home. Yeah, I, said, I don't want these things here. They keep showing up. I don't know. They walk in. $6 billion. Collegiate sports merchandise. Nothing wrong with collegiate sports merchandise. You know, uh, jerseys, hats. College license apparel cost sports fans $5 billion last year. So now here's the conundrum, right? This is the difficulty. Jesus says, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. But do you see all the activities and all the voices saying, go ahead, buy me, eat, oink, oink, feed me, feed me. Can, can you see the battle taking place in all of our lives? I'm not talking or trying to preach down to you. I'm trying to say that this is a tough gig that we have been asked to do. We've been asked to deny ourselves of all this stuff I just talked about and follow Jesus. I said, God, you're, you're, you're not fair. That's not that easy, right? Well, is that just, just, come on now. You got to leave me hanging. Is that just me? Let me say it again. It's not that easy. Hello? Amen. It's not that easy. Come on, let's be for real. There's so many things calling you, calling you, calling you. Let's look at the local church. The average donation by adults who attend a church is about $17 a week. Okay? 37% of people who attend church every week and identify themselves as Christians don't give any money to the church. 37%. Think about that. And I, I'm saying this now because we know that money is going somewhere. One in three U.S. American Christians say that it is impossible, and this is a result. One in three U.S. American Christians say that it is impossible for them to get ahead in life because they have too much debt. In total, about 10 million tithers. That's all we have in the United States. In total, in the United States of America, 10 million tithers in the United States. In a country of almost 400 million, we have 10 million tithers. Interesting. They donate about fifty billion annually. That ten billion. That ten million, and at a very small percentage, right? If now I got interest, I go, oh, let me see, and I begin to try to figure this out. If Christians denied themselves and took up Jesus' cross and followed Him, 
If Christians followed the biblical standard of giving across the board, $139 billion would come available every year for the work of the ministry. So just with the money I'm talking about now, Christians have done a great thing. Many churches have done great. But could you imagine tripling that amount? What could be done for God's honor and God's glory? And of course, inside there, there may be a, a, a person who's doing it wrong, who, who's mishandling, and that happens in any industry, right? I know bookkeepers that went to prison for swindling $200,000 because they were the bookkeeper. That happens, to, and they weren't in Christian, that was in a lawyer's office, dumb lawyer. Huh? But if, if Christians gave, there'd be $139 billion every year available to do additional ministry work. It's amazing, huh? So when I'm thinking about that, I understand, I go, you know, I, that, that shouldn't be an issue with Victor Irish, because we want disciples here. Amen. Let me say that, that shouldn't be an issue with Victor Irish, because we want disciples here. Amen. See, true disciples are devoted to Christ. Yeah. And really, there are three very basic characteristics of a person who's devoted to Christ. Anyone, or let me say this, anyone who places these three things before the Lord Jesus are in danger. Self, family, and possession. Before Jesus. Right? Because that's what, and you got to understand, when everything I talked about, those billions and billions and billions, if you boil them down to what they revolved around, it, ran, it revolved around what? Self, family, and possessions. Right? The entertainment, the drinking, whatever it is. Self, it's those things that I talked about earlier, are encompassed in those three things. So now I understand why God says, you know, if you deny yourself and follow me, if you pick up your cross, you'll be able to follow me. If you don't, listen, my friends, these other things that are so appealing and fun to do, aren't they? Yeah. Will keep you occupied. Oh, they will. So this is it's clearly de delineated in the words of Christ. If any man come after me, let him deny himself. See, love for oneself, and that's the key. Love for oneself is the standard for measuring the amount of love we have for others. So when Jesus looks at you, he doesn't say, hey, do you love this person? No, no, he, he says, how much do you love yourself? And once you determine how much you love yourself, right, then he uses that measuring stick to measure your love for others, right? Now, some people love themselves more than others. They, you know, there, there, some people really love them. Oh, I love you. They're like, mm, 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 right? They really love themselves. And so Jesus says, whatever your standard is, what, well, let's put it like this. Like, very, well, well, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but you'll understand what I'm saying. So based on whatever love you have towards yourself, then that's the measurement Jesus will, will have for you and your love for others. So it, her love is going to be different than Sam's love. Right? Corey's love for himself will be different than, 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 than um, Vanessa's love. Uh, um, Jasmine's love for herself. How come I say Vanessa? Oh, yeah, the sisters. Right? Jasmine, they'll be different. So whatever your love for yourself is, that's how Jesus will measure your love for others. So everybody's different. Right? So, deny yourself. Pick up your cross, follow me. See, the cross part is saying, I'm going to take my love for myself and use it as a measuring stick for how I should love someone else. Now, that's a cross. Because those someone else are the very people that sometimes we don't like. Sometimes we like them. But a lot of times we don't. Hello, someone. Hmm. See, Matthew 19, 19, he says, honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. In Matthew 22, 39, he says, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. In Luke 10, 27, let me read it from 27 to 28. He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And... Love your neighbor as yourself. If you answer this correctly, Jesus says, 
Do this and you will live. There it is. So my love for others is not your love for others. It's my love for others. Remember I said it, and I, now I look back at this and I evaluate me based on this. And remember when I came to the Lord, and I said it earlier, I hated everybody. Can I say it again? I did. I didn't like people. I didn't trust no one. Didn't trust women. Didn't trust nobody. I, and so now God had to flip that. Why? And really, my disgust for everybody was based on my soul love for me. And you can measure a person's love for, uh, for themselves by how much they don't like people. Oh, that's a good one. Just think about that one. Just mold that in your head. You ever people that I don't like people? Ooh, that person really loves themselves. Because they think people in general are not worthy of them. That's a whole lot of love. So now you have a measure on that person. That person has to love others like she or he loves herself, themselves. <laughs> yeah, it gets better. See, love for self is innate. And it's a primary concern of an unbeliever, love for self. The unbeliever, all they care, all that beer, potato chips, Taco Bell, porn, whatever, I, all those things I mentioned is, is rooted and energized by an unbeliever's or even a Christian's love for themselves. So Jesus understood that we would be under the seduction of a lot of attractive things that come after us. So it is not that God wants anything from you, but God knows the thing of this world draws you away from his call. That's what he knows. He knows that. So you need to know that. The things in the world, I don't care how nice they are, if it's not God, it ain't good. Even though it might look good, it ain't. So he knows that the love for all these things will draw you away from him. And he's saying, be careful. So likewise, whosoever... He be of, of you that forsaketh not all that he had. He cannot be his disciple. He's talking. He says that. Wow. Isn't that, I'm, I'm like tripping on this, right? So what am I saying? See, Christ did not conceal from us who wanted to follow him what the grace of God would accomplish in our life. He didn't tell us. He didn't hide. He, he said, if you follow me, what? This is what's going to happen. However, while he's telling us what's going to happen in the blessing, the grace, everything could go our way, at the same time, there's all these other voices saying, no! Don't listen to that pastor. He's crazy. They don't want to hear it. Happened at the same time. Hello? It's probably talking to you right now. That's why I'm reading a lot of scriptures. It's not my fault. It's the Bible. See, Christ, let me put it this way. Christ did not promise a dormant eternal life. He promised a life that was going to be exciting. He offered God's grace, which brings a complete changing by putting Christ's new life in a man. A complete change by putting Christ's new life in a woman. See, he wants to put a whole new thing. Now, does anybody want a whole new life? Or are you like, do you just want like a kind of a whole new life? You're cool with some parts of your life? I like this part. So I'll give you this part. I don't like this part. I don't like this one. I don't like this one. Oh, take my husband. Take my wife. But I like this. So then we begin to uh, boil down what we want of our life and say, God, you can have the rest. God says, nope, don't work that way. See, I want all of you because I know what's best for you, and I'm going to give you a prosperous life, but you have to come through my path, not yours. His path is what? Deny yourself. Doesn't sound like fun, huh? Deny yourself. See, can you, I, I think I, I painted a good picture. Can you see the battle that we're all in? It's a battle. And, and the good thing, God has got grace. He loves you, and he's going to work you through it. But nonetheless, you have to want to work through it. You can't game the system. The old nature, which puts self, the old nature, puts self, family, and possession first, is disturbed by the new nature. The new nature I'm talking about in Christ. Right? See, lie not to one another, seeing that you 
put off the old man with his deed, as Paul writes to the Corinthian church. You know that you have an old man? You know, think about the old man, the man void of Jesus, uh, the person who, who never listened to the gospel. That, you know that person I'm talking about? Maybe that person who lied a little bit. That person who cheated a little bit. That person who manipulated a little bit. That person who used their, their body to get their way. Hello, someone. The old, we're talking about the old self. The old self. Now, if you're young here, maybe you don't have an old self, you're young. But if you don't find Jesus, they'll pop up. See, this putting off of the old man is equivalent to really believing in Jesus and being his disciple. See, quiet Christ comes to dwell within us, does he not? And it takes God's grace to do this. You need God's grace. Our old Adamic nature, the old sinful nature, no longer has an uncontested control, but it, it is, it's not eliminated. What am I saying? You have that old nature, that old man. It's still there, but it's contested. That old nature wants to do something, but, but you're, it's contested by the new nature. The new nature says, no! The old nature says, why not? The new nature says, because it's not of God. And the old nature says, but who will know? The new, new nature says, God knows everything. The old nature says, but people won't know. The new nature says, no! And then Jesus says, if you want to be my disciples, deny yourself. Whoa, whoa. See, Paul had the struggle between the victorious nature of Christ within him and the sin that dwelt in him. He had the same struggle. So we're not alone. It's not, it's not a new thing. It's a reality. In Romans chapter 7, verse 14 through 20, let's read this. We know that the law is spiritual. And this is the Apostle Paul writing, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate to do, I do. And if I do what I what, and if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. I'm busted, disgusted, can't even be trusted. That's not in the scripture, I'm just saying that one on prayer. Verse 17, as it is, it is no longer I myself would do it. But it is sin living in me, okay? So then you have this thing, and you've had these battles, where, God, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do this, I don't want to, and you do it. Now, you don't have to raise your hand, but is, is anybody in the house? Okay, God bless two of you, the rest of you. Can you be my pastor? Sin's living in me, that old nature. Verse 18, then Paul comes to an understanding. Now, we all have to come to this understanding. He says, I know, in verse 18, chapter 7, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what, for what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Verse 20, now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is a sin living in me that does it. So what's happening? There's stuff in us that's in you. Oh, I'm good, Pastor. Okay, maybe it might be good. That's why King David had, a, had not only killed a lion, but he killed a bear. Because we all have that little bear in us. You know, a little, not that little cute little teddy bear. We have, Right? We have that one bear, like that bear in that movie, that perverted movie. What's that one thing called? Well, anyway, let me get over here. The bear. What's that guy? Mark Waller was in there? Help me out. Come on, you guys know you all seen it. Ted? Ted, yeah. We, all of us have that little Ted in us. We do. There's something about bears, though, we're very interesting. The reason why some of us are, are cool right now, we're in control. No, I'm cool. Okay, you're cool. I'm glad you're cool. But like all bears, that bear in us, hibernates. It's sleeping. It's just sleeping. Huh? It's waiting for you to wake it up. So how does that happen? We have another adversary, the devil. 
right? So the devil says, I know, I know that bear is in you. How does he know? Because Paul talked about it. There's a bear in there. So the devil's strategy, because if I was a devil, I'd do that too. That's a good strategy, devil. That's a good one. He goes, somehow I got to wake up that little bear. Not Yogi Bear or Boo Boo, but you know what? I'm talking about Ted, right? So the devil is always trying to wake up that bear. And how does he do it? Very simple, because we're simple people. He creates habits. So everybody's got a habit. I don't know what it is, but everybody's got a habit. So he creates habits. Why? Because if he can wake up that habit, oh no. If he can wake up the habit, I don't care what it is. Whatever that happens, if he can wake it up, the bear rises up, comes out of hibernation. Ooh. And when a bear comes out of hibernation, oh, that bear is hungry. Hungry. Nom, 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 nom. So I found it. I said, so here's the clue. Here's the, here's the key. Are you ready? We have to destroy old habits. If we're going to deny ourselves and pick up our cross and follow Jesus, and we're going to have a chance. We're going to have to begin to deny, rather, begin to destroy old habits. See, old habits is one component of putting off the old, old man. Because listen, I had a lot of bad habits before I got saved. And surely, as I got saved, God began to deliver me, deliver me, change me, change me, change me. And really, when I look back, it was a series of bad habits. I had a bad habit of if somebody looked me in the eye, I wanted to sock them in the mouth. That was a bad habit. So I had to deliver myself from a bad habit. I, one time I was in San Francisco, thought I was bad. Minding my own business, went to this place, we're going to the bathroom, and then this border brother looked me in the eye, looked me dead in the eye, and I looked him dead in the eye, and bet my habit. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. Look me in the eye, and my habit got up. Next thing I know, I had 39 border brothers chasing me down. <laughs> Hello, someone. Bad habits. What's your habit? That's just one of many. See, bad habits interrupt your life and prevent you from accomplishing your goals. Very simple. They jeopardize your health, both mentally and physically. And above all, they waste your time and energy. So, most of your bad habits are caused by two things. Are you ready? Stress and boredom. I've heard people say, oh, I'm eating, I'm eating. No, 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 no. Well, why are you eating? Because I'm stressed. Stress makes me eat. Then the other person says, why are you eating? Because I'm bored. You're bored? Yeah, I'm bored. No, 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 no. Eat. But there's a lot of different habits, right? That's what I got nervous. I didn't want to smoke, but I was just so mad. My stress, I had to smoke. Anybody in the house? So, stress and boredom. Most of the time, bad habits are simply a way of dealing with your stress and your boredom. You know, yeah, we all have them biting our nails, overspending on a shopping spree. Hello, someone. Bad habit. Drinking every weekend. Wasting time on the internet. These activities can be a simple response to stress and boredom. So, if the enemy could put stress and imply boredom on you, he can develop a habit, and your habit will keep you from denying yourself and following Jesus. Hmm? Sometimes the stress and boredom, sometimes the stress and boredom that surfaces are, are caused by deep, deep issues. Sometimes. But not always. You know, we have those special cases that have deep issues. You got to deal with them. But I'm talking about regular folk. For the most part, we get stressed. We have boredom. And we do something to occupy our time. And we read 30 billion on here and 25 billion on here and, and 50 billion here and $3,000 a second on here and beer, uh, so many billion. And uh, all these things I meant, billions upon billions, strictly there to occupy your time, to heal your stress. To take away your boredom. The devil's plan, and it's to keep you from God's call in your life. You see the, how slick that dude is? That chamuku, that punk? See, all habits that you have right now, good or bad, are in your life for a reason. And really, I said good or bad, because some are good habits. 
And in some way, these behavior, they provide a benefit for you. Even if they're bad, in your mind, they provide a benefit for you. For you. I've talked to heroin addicts who are strung out on heroin. But you know what? When they were on heroin, they, they thought they were King Kong. They thought they were top of the world. They, they were Superman. Why? Because that drug, for a moment, if, if just a moment, made them feel that they were okay. But they kept doing it. Then it became a bad habit. Huh? Sometimes the benefit is biological like it is for smoking or drugs. Other times, it's emotional. Like it's when you stay in a bad relationship. If you, I, I meant women getting beat down by their own man, just beat down, beat like a circus monkey, beat like a red and mule, you know what I'm talking about? And they stay in the relationship. Why? Because what, that bad habit, still the emotional need that that woman had caused her to stay there. That's a bad habit. But even that bad habit provided an emotional need. That she thought, or he thought, that she thought was good enough to keep her there. And we've talked to them. I've talked to them. Hey, what's wrong? Try to get them out. And they go up, they go, and they come back. Why are you going back? Because he loves me. He's going to change. Wow. And then the devil, who wins? The devil. Keeps you occupied. Why? How can a person in that situation, the, the, not just the girl and that, but the other ones I listed, how can a person in those types of situations really deny themselves? They can't. And if they can't deny themselves, then they can, re- can never, ever really become a disciple of God and find their purpose. See, and I'm trying to pull the devil's cover because you have a purpose. You're special. You're worth more than that. God didn't create you to be like that. God created you to be on top, huh? to be the head and not the tail, to prosper, to walk with your head up high, not be abused by any man or woman, person, place, or thing. Mm. So how do we break it? Romans 4.17, and I'm going to give you a few ways how to break it, and then we're going to close. In Romans 4.17, Paul says something very, very, to me, very encouraging. He said, Abraham is our father in the sight of God and in whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead and like, like this part, and calls things that are not as though they were. Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed and so became the father of of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Ooh. So who, when, when I read that, who is he talking to? Listen, my friend, he's talking to you. He said, Abraham believed God. Against all hope, he believed God. Right? He, the God who calls things that are not as though they were, that same God, he believed, so shall his offspring be. What are you saying? So shall you be. You have within you the ability to believe beyond no hope. When you see no hope, you have it in you. It's, it's there. But what happened is that little teddy bear is keeping it down. No, 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 no. See, the devil doesn't want you to tap that. That is a power source like, like no other power source. That is a motivating tool like no other motivating tool. There is something deep inside you. Why? Because God said it's there. Because we are Abraham's offering. So shall your offspring be. Not, it might be, so shall your offspring be. They will have faith to believe things that are not as though they were. Come on, if you're going to praise the Lord, go ahead and praise him. So what do we got to do? We got to deny ourselves. The first part, first step really is choose a substitute for your bad habit. If you have a bad habit, you have to, you can't just, see, because it's not realistic. You can't say, well, I no longer have this bad habit. No, no, no. You have to choose a substitute for it. You remove a bad habit, and you put a good habit. Because whether we like it or not, we are creatures of habit. Even when you don't like it, you are. I, of all people, I know me, I'm a creature of habit. What have I said? I've used the same cologne since 1985. I don't change. I'm like the Holy Ghost. I don't change. Amen? 
People, do you want a new, new cologne? What for? No, I, I, got, I got that's good. Leave me alone. Right, Deborah? I just had the same one. Boom. Because, you know, some guys nowadays, they, you know, they are like a pharmacy of cologne. Wow, wow. Multitudes of cologne. Well, that's cool. I guess. But my habit, I just stuck. Right? Habits. We're creatures of habit. You brush your teeth the same way you always brush your teeth. Some start on the bottom on the right, some start on the left on the right. But whatever way you do it, you do it the same way every day. You don't just change it. Why? Because you're a creature of habit. You comb your hair the same way. That's why every day you go, how come my hair can't change? Because you're combing it. You want it to be different. Let somebody else comb it because you are a creature of habit. You can't help it. No matter how hard you try, you keep doing the same thing. That's why you go to someone else to do it for you if you want to look different. Because we're creatures of habit. And the enemy knows that. So you have to find your bad habit and put a new one there, a good one. No, everybody is, is different. I can't deduce everyone for everyone. But you can. Why? Because you have God in you. So you need to plan ahead of time for how you respond when you're faced with stress or boredom. That prompts your bad habit. What are you going to do? And when, when you're going through stress and boredom, if you run to the refrigerator, stop running to the refrigerator and run around the block. Bad habit with new habit. Right? It's up to you. Second thing, cut out as many triggers as possible. Things that trigger you. Every time I get around this person, I want to smoke. Stop getting around that person. Sorry. Until you can get around the person and you don't smoke, stop it. That's a trigger. Every time I, I, I turn on this TV, I do this. Then stop turning on that TV. Then you won't do that. Every time I, you fill in the blank, I do this. You got to find the triggers. Why? Because I'm trying to give you practical tools for you to deny yourself. Otherwise, you won't deny yourself. We're, we're too, we're, we love ourselves too much to deny ourselves. Huh? So make it easier on yourself to break bad habits by avoiding the things that caused them. Huh? Change your environment, and you can change your outcome. Secondly, join forces with somebody. That's what we talk about in Victor Arch. We always have high accountab accountability. In some churches, why well, are you so accountable? Why? Because we know, we're, we're, we're honest enough to know that we all have bad habits. And if we're accountable to somebody, then somebody can keep us in check. Hey, watch out, that man. Don't be doing that. You know that's your habit. You know, you know what you do when you go to your homes. Don't go there. Other churches like to fake it like they're all perfect and nothing wrong. We don't play that here. We know we have issues. We have to be careful and watch each other's back. Right? See, the two of you can hold each other accountable and celebrate your victories together. Knowing that someone else expects you to be better. Let me say it again. Knowing that someone else expects you to be better is a great motivator. You know, I've been in a place, I don't want to let this person down. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to change. I'm going to be better. Why? Because I don't want to let this one down. Because, you know, I'm accountable to this one. And we made a pact. And we said we're going to work with each other. We're going to help each other. And I don't want to let them down. And on the other side, I don't want to let them down. Boom, two together. Amen. You celebrate victories together. You, you don't have to do it alone. It's very difficult to do it alone. I'm not saying you can't. But that's, well, that's a hard way to do it. Number four, surround yourself with people who live the way you want to live. Don't, under, don't underestimate the power of finding some new friends. Hang around with the right people. When we deal with people in rehab, we t you know, you got to cut, you got to, you know, change your route. You know how you have a route. You know, if you're here, oh, I have my, what's your route? You know, you go down Platte, you make a ride on Van Buren, you go down here. You have a route. And the reason you have that route, because you're connected there or something's there that you're used to going there. Change your route. I tell people, don't go south of Constitution. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Don't act like you're shy. Change your route. Surround yourself with people that you want to live like them. Surround yourself. Hang with them. Think with them. Dream with them. I'm not saying go south, don't go south of Constitution, but you know my ideal. Right? Lastly, visualize yourself succeeding. Remember we said we are the people that 
can, we believe things as though they are, right? We see things by the teacher, see you as a businessman, see you huh? as how you see you can be. Not where you're at. Begin to visualize what you can be. Listen, my friend, there are, the greatness is in you. Now, we're not in some other third world country where greatness may be in them, but they don't have the tools or the hand to accomplish it. Listen, there's nothing that we can't do in this country because it's all available to you. There's nothing limited to you. Nothing. I was sharing with some people, are you kidding me? I was in the ghetto, in the neighborhood. I got out and got a double master's and a, and a PhD, or actually an EDS, right? And the government paid me to do this. Are you kidding me? What kind of a country are we living in? This is this country. This is the blessing that we have at hand. If we only believe and don't let these other obstacles get in our way, the bad habits if we begin to start walking like we're supposed to walk, with our head up high, and don't fall victim. See, that is, my friend, denying yourself. It's denying yourself. I'll use my example because I don't want to pick on you. I'll use Anthony because he went through it. I used to laugh when he was going through it. He's in school, and he's struggling. Pain, the pain. Sammy, he's been there. The pain of trying to get your masters. The pain and suffering. And I would look and laugh. <laughs> Why? Because I know what they're going through. But what are they doing? They actually are learning to deny themselves and pick up a cross. See, and when you learn that attribute, you can take that experience of pain and denying and, and, and then accomplishing a goal, you can take that thing and you can, you can apply that principle to any situation in your life. Because you're going, it's getting hard, I'm working hard, and I'm struggling. But you're going to say, but you know what, I struggled to get that degree. I, I denied myself. I, didn't, I couldn't do all the things that my flesh wanted me to do because I had to get my stuff done. It was hard for five, six years. It was difficult. I hated it, but I finished it. You learn to deny yourself and pick up a cross. That is why those with degrees make like 80% more than those without degrees. Money. Why? Because they've learned a principle. Now, not everybody has to do that in college, but there are opportunities where you have to learn to deny yourself that flesh and do something that's going to benefit who you are. Because all the other stuff, it's just a waste of time. If there's no return on your investment, how much time have you invested on things that never, you've got nothing back? How much time, how many movies can you go to and get nothing in return? Oh, you have entertainment, but unless you're Cecil B. DeMille, you're not making a movie. So you've just entertained yourself. Okay, there's a time for that. However, if you want to accomplish a goal and you want to do something great for God, you have to deny yourself and begin to put you in a position to do that. Everybody's looking at me real quiet. Huh? So you have to visual, visualize yourself succeeding as, as I come in for a landing. The bottom line is we must choose. See, when an unbeliever understands what will automatically take place as a result of salvation, an unbeliever, he or she may be honest enough to reject salvation. I don't want it. Right? And that's okay. The rich young ruler did it. I didn't want it. But you're going to have to make a choice. Because when you're talking about being Christ's disciple, you're going to have to make a choice. You're going to have to find a, po a choice, and God, the Holy Spirit, will lead you to that choice, just perfect for you, where you said, okay, you want to follow me? Here it is, Corey. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. You want to follow me? Here it is, your plan. It's not, it's not Sam's plan. Huh? It's not Janetta's plan. This is your plan. Here's your plan. This is yours, perfect for you. It's perfect God, the Holy Spirit will do it. Perfect for you. Are you going to deny yourself and follow him, or are you going to just do what you want? You, everybody has to make a choice. Nobody 
put a gun to my head and say, you better follow Jesus and be obedient to your pastor, and you better submit to the Holy Ghost, and you better accept the call of pastor, because if you don't, I'm going to shoot you. No. I made a choice. I knew I had to deny myself if I wanted to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. It was my choice. Huh? See, Joe, Jesus told the rich young ruler what must happen in his life for him to receive Christ's grace and eternal life. You know the story of the rich young ruler. Matter of fact, let me read it, and I'm going to close with this promise. A certain ruler asked Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I've kept since I was a boy, said the rich young Lord. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor. Wow. Then you can come follow me. When he heard this, the rich young Lord became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through an eye, through the eye of a needle, than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Whew. Rich man. Now, let's go to the introduction. Hundreds of billions are spent by rich folk in this country. And this pastor has to say, man, you want to be a disciple of Christ? You got to be careful with all those hundreds of billions. Everybody's got their own job, their own thing, but God is going to speak to you better than I can ever do. But whatever it is, you're going to have to look at that whole list of things in front of your life and say, are these hindering me? Or should I deny myself so I can follow Christ? The only person who can answer that is you. And the only person who knows the answer is God. I wish I could tell you and convince you to do the right thing. I've tried that. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. See, Jesus knew that this was not what the man wanted to do. Yet he still presented God's truth to him. Therefore, as a result of his inability to deny himself... The man remained rich materially, but spiritually dead. The, G, the Lord Jesus in no way demands you to, to sell all your belongings and give them the poor. No, no. However, when he says, when he saves a person, Jesus must be first in that person's life. Family possession must be available for the altar of sacrifice for his sake. See, he's, Jesus said some powerful words, but he also said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Jesus said that too. He also said, Christ said another time, for what is a man profit if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? Or what should a man give in exchange for his very own soul? So we have to understand that God wants you to win. I want you to prosper. Hmm? See, when Jesus Christ is first, I know this. When Christ is first, I, am, I enjoy full, fully myself. <laughs> Let me say it again. When Jesus Christ is first, I enjoy me. When I put selfish things in front of Christ, I'm not happy with myself. You ever been in that place where you're not happy with yourself? Ah, that's a telltale sign that you're first and not Jesus. When Jesus is first, you like yourself. When he's first, I feel good. I'm, I'm like James Brown. Oh, I feel good. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling good. Huh? When Jesus is first, I spend quality time with my family. When Jesus is first, I, not my possessions, determine my path when Jesus is first. See, Jesus was not just talk, talking to his disciples of old. He was talking to us. He said, if any man will come after me, 
whosoever will come after me. So, I pray this afternoon, you are that person that says, I'll do it, Christ. I'll do it, Jesus. I want every head bowed and every eye closed.